Gamers Podcast, episode 175, fool! Whoa, whoa, Josh, be careful. Uh-oh. Okay. I'm, I'm in a confined space right now. Hold oh, your okay. breath. We're doing a uh, a hybrid episode this week. And a very and a very safe episode as well. I don't know if it's going to be safe once we kind of get started to talk about this. That's very true. I just meant safe in the sense of like we're not getting each other sick. As you can see, we've t- we've taken precautions. Although Larry's mask isn't exactly helping him. I think it's doing more worse than it is good right yeah, now. I, I'm I'm dying in this thing, so it, th- that's about it. It's. <laughs> I have been the first to fall. There was a challenge laid down to me before we started recording, and I plan on living out that challenge this entire episode. All right. Hey. Well, that's fine because I don't have to look at you. Yeah, uh, I just have to look at my camera. <laughs> it's a dream come true for me. What are you talking about? <laughs> I get to record in this thing. Uh, so oh, welcome boy. to the podcast where we talk nerd, we talk hope, and we speak nothing else. I'm your host, Captain Nostalgia. And if you guys haven't figured out, we are doing a hybrid episode of Victims and Villains, Retro Gamers this week. And this just kind of seems to be a tradition at this point. Anytime we decided, anytime Netflix decides to do a new season of Castlevania. <laughs> so this epi- this season is uh, 10 episodes long. It covers, uh, so we're going to be covering the entirety of the, the 10 episodes uh, here on Victims and Villains. And if you guys would like to, please go subscribe and see what we're talking about on YouTube for the Retro Gamers. You guys can see how we start this episode out in full on mask mode. Larry's still going strong. I am. I'm, gonna, I'm carrying this all the way out. What are you kidding me? If, if, I'm, if I'm nothing else, I, I am a consummate professional and carry out my deeds. So... Uh, yeah, prof- professional in quotes, please. <laughs> this uh, this answers a lifelong question that I've had since I've met you, of what you would look like without eyebrow- eyebrows. <laughs> well, I had them waxed recently, so you almost got close to that. I think you should uh, just shave a- them, man. Just embrace the luchador <laughs> look. Josh, I'm a little concerned as to why, of all the questions that can pop up in your head about Larry, that was the thing you were wondering. <laughs> I often wonder <laughs> what people look like without eyebrows. Just saying. I mean, that's true. Everyone, you know, it's like it's one thing like Anthony growing up. Anthony always had glasses on. And, you know, the the first time I saw him like without glasses, I was like, who are you? And what would you do with my friend? Oh. <laughs> but now I'm well, used to it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, yeah, when I was younger, I had the Clark Kent Superman thing going on like because <laughs> my my glasses were so oversized for my face <laughs> when i was a kid that you really could you really they had were, no idea who i was when i took them off they, they kind of were a little big now that i think about it oh no they were gigantic <laughs> they were gigantic like when i go, when i go back and look at pictures i'm like oh okay i was like they're bigger than half of my head <laughs> gosh oh well well you're doing good now with the contacts or the lasik or new new eyeballs whatever it was yes and there's nothing safer right now than to you know taking my finger and sticking it in and out of my eye there you the go uh, height of the coronavirus <laughs> as long as you wash your hands and sing happy no this is ridiculous i gotta take this off yeah uh and professionalism okay, last all, right. all the time oh, oh, no. i feel better <laughs> all right i was just getting hot so just waiting for it to hit the fan i guess it did uh, not all right, and uh, representing the United States proudly. Very good. Yeah, and speaking uh, of, uh, this... well, not the United States, but this is uh, just the Retro Gamers Podcast episode. <laughs> 175. It is absolutely <laughs> off the rails. Yeah, we've already, we've already gone completely off the rails here. This is it. It's, I blame Josh. This happens when we do hybrid episodes, so it you really guys do what you're looking for. We have a blast doing these. Uh, Castlevania. Holy cow. Um this was an interesting season. Um, I know we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it in depth. Uh, and, you know, Josh did a minor spoiler with us personally in the chat room when we were talking. And he threw it out. He's like, uh, yeah, you know, hentai, look out. So I was only in like episode one. So then <laughs> I, re- I spent the rest of the episodes waiting for it. <laughs> 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 did like did like the tension mount within you it you just really, like really i'm like because i'm trying to figure out all right where is this gonna fit first of all in mm-hmm. the storyline um and then, and then i mean they just went from zero to 60 at that point we'll get to it uh but um you know before that part 
you know, Josh, definitely you know, let us know a little bit about the episodes. I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it, but I do have some uh, opinions about it. Same. I, I think that this is a this is a stronger season than season two, but not as strong as season one. And there, it gets to a point where it walks in season one's strength, but it never reaches it. But it's a definite improvement. But I do think that there are moments like the the hentai scene where it's just like unwarranted and unneeded because Mm -hmm. when you have when you've a when you've been waiting for as long as you we have been forced the the time period between season two and season three you're only going to have a short period of time to tell this to tell these stories and i liked how they balanced certain things to continue world building and setting for future seasons but then you also at the same time have to say okay well we have to really take advantage of these characters and while one of the one of the two hentais that is involved in the season actually amounted to something the other one was kind of like why did I need this character in the season to even begin with? Because he adds nothing to the larger narrative. Like there's, there's no cohesive nature. He just kind of seems to exist just to say, Hey, remember this guy? Uh, interesting. And I guess I am going to argue uh, of the three of us that this was the strongest season yet. And oh. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm not saying that. I- <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Oh, whoa. So COVID. Um, I'm not <laughs> saying that. I'm sorry, my my humor. I apologize. Um, uh, <laughs> we're yeah, remember mess. this is a this is a hybrid. I know, episode. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't even even do those jokes on our own podcast. That's um, very true. Um, but um, I enjoyed the sh- the season, and I think Josh, to your credit, or to your point, I should say, I don't think you're saying that you hated the season. You still enjoyed the season, just. It probably wasn't the best of the three. I find it interesting you find the first season, which was four episodes, mm-hmm. the strongest. Uh, I may want to come back and revisit that part. Um, but yeah, the hentai, uh, which for those of you who may not know, and I'll do this delicately, hentai is just a, like adult anime. So, oh, speaking of which, speaking of adult anime, look who adult just showed up. Adult anime! So, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, you know, Going into even from season one of Castlevania, we knew this was gonna be, uh, you know, this wasn't a kids' cartoon. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. the blood, the violence, which is fine. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, it's all warranted. But you know, if you want to talk about it now, yeah, those two scenes, one I felt was needed, and yeah, the other one I felt was out of place. That's and that's that's the biggest problem that I had with that and the character that's involved with it very much feels out of place throughout the entirety of this season like almost all the characters involved in that season or that scene become just very much out of place and the fact that they have it littered and spliced together throughout the entire episode like it's not just a one and done scene but it they are scenes that they are continually you have the main storyline you have one hentai and then you have another and they're littered together throughout the course of it and it's supposed to be this cohesive narrative and i'm like why do i like why do i need to keep coming back to this because every time they would show it it would just take me out of what was the happening with the main plot with uh cypher and belmont Real quick, I just want to just mention, I, I, and I know we're dancing around it. You know, we're going to talk about it in a moment. But I feel like Josh, the one scene you thought was out of place, I feel the other scene was the one out of place. Um, before, and, and I know okay, we're, let, we're being let, very vague. Yeah, let's let's hold, kind of hold on. Hold on one second. Since since we're talking about the actual scenes, I think, uh, and I I think we're jumping a little bit too far since we're going all the way to episode nine. But just <laughs> just just to point it out really quickly for people who are listening or watching. It's in episode. We're talking episode nine, and we're talking about one of the scenes is Alucard with Taka and Sumi, mm-hmm. and the other scene is with Lenore and Hector. Is that correct? Yes. This is what correct. we're talking about. Okay, so so there was uh, a one on one, and then a triple threat. Right, exactly. Yeah. So those are the two scenes we're talking about, and one of you is arguing apparently that the Alucard one was out of place. The other one's arguing that the Lenore one was out of place. I think. I, hold on, Josh. So let's. 
Yes. So let's do this. So uh, here on Victims and Villains, we're going to take a quick commercial break. You guys, but if you or someone you know is struggling with suicide, addiction, self harm, or depression, you guys can reach out to us on any of our social media. You can call the Suicide Lifeline at 1 800 273 8255. You can text HELP to 741 741 or go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. You guys can get even more resources past the ones that I've just mentioned. And I'm sure that anyone who is currently listening to this on the Retro Gamers feed, you guys can also get all of those resources wherever you guys are currently listening to this, as well as if you guys are listening to this on the Victims and Villains feed, you guys can, wherever you guys are currently listening to this, all those links are going to be in the show notes for this episode. Please, suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. There are 130 plus suicides that take place each and every day. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So please, if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can reach out to us on any of our social media. Once again, uh, the reason we create this content, as much as we love talking about video games and anime, is so that you guys can know that you have value and worth. This is the real reason. This is the heartbeat and the bedrock of our everyday content. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back to Victims and Villains and the Retro Gamers Luchador Podcast. Oh, Uh, yeah. I, I didn't agree to that title. Hey, you know what would make this even better? luchador singing podcast no 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 that makes nothing better and this is now your official (laughs) spoiler warning (laughs) yes that is true i kind of forgot about the spoiler and anthony's gone all righty oh josh is something i've been trying to do for two and a half years good lord wow finally got the episode to myself oh there he is never mind he's almost back he's coming back into frame there he is (laughs) does he bring cats with him it's very easy to get rid of me. Just start singing. <laughs> so Castlevania, people. <laughs> just wait Just wait another couple of weeks, and I ordered something that's going to make you bat crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so uh, Ca- Castlevania? Yes. Go. go for it. Let's go back to Castlevania, because also a little later in this episode, we are going to talk about the games, um, because I got some stuff to talk about with Castlevania. Mm-hmm. But, again, we're talking about the Netflix episode, uh, shows, and... Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so where we left off is the <laughs> we're just going right into episode nine. Well, let's uh, jump let's into the uh, like where we find these characters in yeah, the let's, beginning. Let, let's let's rewind. We'll get to the we'll get to the controversy of episode nine later and later on. Um, but yeah, go, uh, Josh, let, give us a recap. Where do we find our characters? <laughs> so Alucard is kind of he's now in a defunct mansion. Of his He's father, in a defunct, defunct. Yes, <laughs> he uh, no longer travels anymore, and he's just kind of hanging out with the the Belmont legacy uh, by his side, and just kind of enjoying, you know, the uh, the post snap Thanos life. You know, just hanging yeah. out, just being a farmer. I, I wouldn't say enjoying per se. Yeah, yeah, because he uh, he does definitely explore uh, some themes of like depression and isolation very early on in the series, which I. I thought was kind of a interesting place to find him as a character to where he had such a anger and such a wrath towards his father throughout the second season to where he, you know, all he wanted to do was kind of kill him. And then they had that very tender aside in towards the end of the second season and Dracula does end up dying and it's kind of one of those things that once you we talked about this recently here on a we did an event and uh we talked about just the mental health capacity that something like revenge or anger bitterness how it holds and how it takes its toll on your mental health and how it doesn't bring satisfaction that's ultimately where you find alucard at the beginning where he had been chasing this thing for so long and ultimately once he had gotten it there was no satisfaction there was no satisfaction. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think, um, and I think it's actually a very poignant story for him because you're dealing you're dealing with somebody now. In to your point, in the aftermath of revenge, realizing that not only is it not all it's cracked up to be, but we're also seeing, um, we're also seeing the result of this. Um, I, I would almost call it a self imposed isolation in a way, not to juxtapose it to what's going on in the real world right now, but it, it's actually it's actually an interesting um, 
it's actually an interesting way of uh, <laughs> looking at it because not only not only has he kind of imposed this bit of isolation, but at the same time, he's dealing with the rack of guilt. Like he's literally guilty about the fact that you know he murdered his father, and you're just you're seeing how he's punishing himself. I mean, to the point of where he becomes so lonely and so um, so disconnected that he's desperate and like yearning for some type of connection to the real world again, even though he is subconsciously punishing himself for what he did. And it was, you know, this scene as well, the, the, the first scene with Alucard, uh, you know, in the, the next door to the castle and everything, this is where to me, the season kind of like the tone for the season like that's where I got it from. This, so I'm like, all right. So everyone's dealing with the aftermath. Uh, you know, Alucard. Yeah, you know, killed his father. We're gonna see. You know, where where uh, all the other characters are gonna be at this point. And what I didn't realize till a, a little bit later on is kind of the subtle, what I'll call humor, which the show always kind of had a little bit with with, with Trevor mm-hmm. Belmont. Like he just is kind of no care attitude. But we have this scene of Alucard eating a meal talking to cypher and trevor but they're like they're they're dolls that yeah. he created but it, like he did it kind of in a way like his voice was like like a little higher pitched and i'm like that does that wouldn't to me sound like alucard like he's almost having a little too much fun with this mm-hmm. and it i got to admit some of the what i'll call humor took me out of the season a little bit and this was one of the first ones that did it i'm not saying i was ready to turn the show off but I was like, oh, it's just kind of an odd way to to introduce all this. And then we move forward, um, especially with the twins that he meets later on. Well, I mean, let me ask you this. Like, have you ever been isolated in your home for a snowstorm? I without... do a podcast about video games. Of course, I'm always isolated in, in my <laughs> house. Yeah. Like, old, old joking aside, this weekend that we're recording, yeah, I, I probably... It probably would have stayed in anyway, but you know, with with everything that's going on in the real real world, like Anthony said, yeah, you know, isolation's more of a thing now. But I've definitely spent my time inside, um, and uh, I guess it depends on like really like what kind the of person. personality you exactly. are because. Mm-hmm. Like I've had snow days where like I am like it's so bad up here in Pennsylvania where we get snow and mm-hmm. it'll just shut down like traffic and roads and businesses because well, it's too dangerous and i end up losing my mind by like hour six and so <laughs> i end up taking the a la carte way of making voodoo dolls and yeah, doing basically. impersonations oh is that why is that why my back hurts sometimes and i can't figure it out <laughs> i'm sorry the the, yeah. the the real quick the closest thing i can equate to that for me being on long island is hurricane sandy Mm-hmm. Because Hurricane Sandy knocked out the power here on Long Island for uh, five days. I mean, my parents, they, and I spent a week with them. They were out, they were without power and heat for almost a month. Mm-hmm. So I totally understand, like all joking aside, I, I do get that that isolation because here I am in my apartment and I lived in a basement apartment. So forget about the mornings. I had no sun. You know, because I live in a basement and I'm just sitting there, literally just sitting there in the dark. It it, it is a weird feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, Yeah. And just to relate, I think uh, in general, um, uh, at least uh, moments of isolation for me, I'm a very short tempered person when it comes to doing things. Um, So I can't sit still. So for me, yeah. yeah. So for me, like even being like, a lot like stuck for like six hours drives me crazy, let alone days. Yesterday, yeah, you know, now that you know, in the real world, you know, they're saying social distancing, do some self isolation. I was sitting in my house yesterday and just like texting a friend, complaining. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so bored. I don't know what else to do. And he's like, dude, it's day one. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> barely. I was like, I was like <laughs> and, and you know, you you can say that Alucard's um, dolls of Trevor and Cipher are kind of like my cats because I talk to my cats. <laughs> I talk to my I, I talk to my cats all the time, all the time. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's just one of those things. It's like um, it, it's a it, it tests basically um, your mental capacity and your me- basically your mental strength. 
Um, and after a while, you know, depending on how long you have to be isolated, it gets to you because you're craving that interaction that, you know, some type of interaction that's literally right outside your door, but for some reason you can't have it. Um, and in Alucard's case, he technically could, he, if he wanted to, he could go out into the world, and there's a, and that's the difference there, in a sense, because he has chosen this type yeah. of isolation, and as a result of it, he's chosen to essentially start going mad. Where I agree with you, and there are people. There's like two types of people in this world. There's an Alucard when it comes to isolation, and then there's Trevor Belmont when it comes to isolation. Because I feel like Trevor, albeit he's with Cipher now, I think before her. He had no problem. He wanted to be alone. Like cool. he, I think he preferred that. And I feel like I'm a Trevor. He had, <laughs> he had different, like he had a legacy about his name and yeah, that he wasn't crazy about. Well, he, he was, he was yeah. fine living up to it, but yeah, you know, it took a toll on him mentally where I feel he could, he could have like going into season one. Like if you can think of the backstory, backstory, which is the video game, um, you know, I think Trevor probably wants to be on his own. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what, that's when we first initially meet him. And I think that the reason why we initially met him that way is to your point. It's like it, it's the weight it's the weight of the legacy that's on him. And even mm -hmm. though he's up for the task, it doesn't mean that he necessarily enjoys the fact that he's doing this. I think he's good at it and he knows he's good at it and all of that. But it just takes a toll on you. And you get to that point where it's like, you know what, I've seen enough horrors in the world and i've inflicted enough horror in the world that i i'm kind of perfectly fine just being removed from it okay i agree with you on that yeah whereas yeah. larry you you don't you don't want to be removed from the world you you just do it often i do i do and i don't have a problem with it i'm not saying i'm just i'm, it's no, no, not no, I'm like just a, saying yeah you yeah. know it's not like come knock my door down i'm just like right i just that's how i am I, but then you also see now when you're looking at season three now, we're well beyond the whole idea of Trevor being alone. Um, you see what Saifa has brought out in him, obviously, not only as a companion, but uh, as, a, a, you know, pretty much. I, I don't want to say it's interesting because I don't want to say even though they're kind of shacking up together. I don't want to say that they're uh, I don't want to say that they're a couple. You know what I mean? It, it's it's almost like they're companions with benefits. That's how I see them. I don't see them as like mm -hmm. a couple couple. I don't know if that if, the, if did I you get a say? Did you get a sense that they were like together or just Josh, you what's know. your thoughts? I felt like they were like dating. Yeah, you could definitely feel that they were dating because there are several scenes littered throughout the throughout the episodes where they'll wake up in bed next to each other or they're cuddling or there seems to be a closer bond and a closer intimacy within them. And that to me was one of the strongest points of this season, in all honesty, because I felt like I felt like tra I, I stood back and as I was thinking about each character's arc throughout the course, obviously we've spent the most time with Trevor Belmont and to kind of see where we where we find him at the end of the pilot to where we get him throughout the end of this third season and its duration, he feels like a well-rounded character. Like you could see uh, recently um we did an event and we were talking about uh, the importance of community and how we're biologically created to be around other people. Like there's something within us that we just need to have uh, around other people. And one of the things that uh, makes that so is the fact that, you know, we are <clears throat> the fact that we are we need community uh, for the sake of our, our own mental health. And I think that's a super important uh, thing that they get to explore. And it kind of almost seems like when he's around Cypher, like you can definitely see that he's been missing that for the entirety of what we've seen him as a character. And so it felt more rounded to his character. It added new dynamics and the two of them just had really great chemistry. And it was something that I didn't, I did not know that I needed until I actually stepped into the season. I loved and adored the, the relationships throughout the season with between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, no, they I, definitely, yeah, they definitely, they brought, they brought a light 
pun intended, I guess, they brought a light to the season that was majority full of this darkness and which it's both it's Castlevania. Um, mm-hmm. and the, and it's a, you're right. It's a complete, if I may steal a title from another podcast, a yin and yang, uh, between, um, Alucard, who's just so, you know, dark as far as his isolation versus Trevor and Cypher, who are in this town now, um, almost trying to live with the townspeople, live like townspeople. Which is, yeah. uh, I didn't, no. sorry. No, no um, I was gonna, I was going to say, I thought, I thought that made you make a really good point. And it also shows you how much Trevor has changed since we first met him. Um, and how they do that. Like you can, you, you sense not only the, uh, not necessarily the light between them, but the, like you know the uh, just uh, the strength between the two of them, and yeah. how now they complement each other. Um, but just them coming into town and the just the overall heroicism between the two of them, and how they now share it with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's funny that you talk about the 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 themes being a little bit darker in this season, but the there are certain sequences as you get later on into it, and a lot of the I'm not sure if you've seen any of the marketing for like the one shot posters of this, but it's definitely a brighter color palette uh than previous mm-hmm. seasons. Uh I love and absolutely adore the banner that they release. It it kind of almost has like this floral feel to it that I just think is like when I saw it, I hadn't seen any trailers for Castlevania. I was like I'm sold on this. And I, I think that once you kind of get deeper into it and you kind of introduce the oh man, what was the what was the thing underneath the, of it called the eternal what? Oh, the eternal corridor. Yeah, the eternal corridor. Yeah. Once you kind of introduce that into it, it, it kind of really the, opens uh, infinite, up the, the infinite, infinite, corridor. That's what, infinite yeah. corridor. Sorry. You, Which you is really, actually a real thing. You you really start to open up the 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 doors uh to like Pun more intended. of a yeah more of a of a <laughs> color palette in it that I I really think complements it the the darker nature of the season really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think um, well, I mean, let's just I guess let's just stick to the Trevor story <laughs> since uh, we 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 essentially had four um we had four basic uh, storylines here out of all of this and sticking with the Trevor one the whole uh, yeah they were the ones that really brought anything kind of light into it with the whole magics in the infinite corridor. And then we also got, you know, we got to meet a new character, Count St. Germain, who mm. I was really, uh, I, I found him very interesting and I really liked the direction they went with him. Um, you know, the scholar who's coming in looking, well, obviously he's looking for somebody and they, you, you, you'll know very clearly, they never tell you exactly who he's looking for, Yeah, which I thought was interesting. Cause I'm assuming we'll find that out in season four. Because I was sitting there saying, "Is it was it his wife, girlfriend, daughter? Like who was it that he was looking for?" We never really got the answer to that. Um, I well, I but, kind of thought he was looking for Dracula. No, he was looking for, if I remember correctly, I no, think somebody he was else looking for his wife because his wife had gotten stuck in the infinite corridor. Oh yes, yes, yes. Because yeah. okay, I got you. By the way, the infinite <laughs> corridor actually exists at MIT. Oh. oh. Uh, see now I, I must have missed the part where he said it was his wife that got stuck I know he said he was looking for somebody I just didn't I don't rem- I didn't it, remember him saying it was his wife it is the scene where him Trevor and Cypher at the bar go to the bar oh, okay so he kind of like explains and does a lot of uh, exposition for his character uh, there Yep, um, I, I just forgot that part. But I think, um, but what I really enjoyed was that um, um, I really enjoyed the story that uh, that he was in and the involvement and how he was really he was our main um, he was our main drive into the Priory while Trevor and Sypha were trying to figure out what was going on in the town with the judge, who was also a very interesting character. I thought I liked the judge. He Same. his yeah his you know he brought. Like it, it well, <laughs> I mean, I liked him in the beginning. Um, you wow. know, the ju- yeah, the judge looked like was going to be a character. Like in this series, everyone, I assume that Trevor and Cypher were going to interact with, were going to try and kill them in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. And the judge comes off as you know he he's in charge of what's the name of the town again? Does anyone remember Lin- Lingrenfell? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, Lindenfeld. Lindenfeld. And um, so he's in charge of Lindenfeld, and, like, he's trying to keep peace between the regular town folk and the... Um, priory. Yeah, the Priory uh, up on top of the hill or whatever. And, um, 
you know, at first I thought he was maybe part of that, but as the episodes go on until, you know, episode nine or 10, I'm like, all right, this guy's not so bad. You know, he's actually, he wants oh, good oh. in the neighborhood. Yeah, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, that ending though, that ending, that was creepy. Uh, which I, I I liked because that that was like whoa they really this guy had an issue with nothing to do with the priory nothing to do with with Trevor or or Sypha being there he was just on his own nutty and um, the the part that clicked for me with that was uh, later on like episode five or six when the boy was running through town wanting an apple and he gives this this detailed explanation how to get to like the judge's private um apple tree and even with that i'm like that's kind of detailed that's a little weird and then when he started explaining that again i forgot who he explained it to he explained it to somebody else he explained uh, it to um the the um uh the lead the lead guy in the priory i can't remember oh that's name. right yes yes uh and then mm-hmm. i'm like oh wait a minute there's something even worse than that and then when they and then when he came out of the room sweating in his, in his house I'm mm-hmm. like, this guy, oh, there is something with this guy. And again, I thought it was with the Priory, and then they cut to what, like the last, I think it was in episode 10, Yeah, when they finally time. get into the house, and he's got a collection of kids' shoes, and I'm like, no way! Yeah. That is messed up. And, um, yeah. Well, and, and it's just a it's just a testament to the, I think, the character development they did the, that they're doing in this series, which I really think is with their strong suit. Like, the character development to me in this is excellent. And seeing a character that you're following throughout the entire sh- uh, season where you're, you're – at first you're not sure about him and then you kind of figure out – it's like, oh, no, he's on Trevor and Cypher's yeah, side so we can side, trust yeah. him and he's great. But then you look be- – and then obviously you peel back the curtain and it's like just because – so, and again, it teaches you just because somebody has good intentions in one way does not mean that they're generally overall a good person overall. He clearly had a dark side. We learned about it right at the end. And when we say dark, like it doesn't really get much darker yeah, no, than, than what he was doing. Yeah. I mean, it it's kind of almost feels like it's the their version of like John Wayne Gacy to where you have a guy that's very lovable. But then, you know, it throws you for a twist and you find out oh hey no he's got a dark side his dark side includes killing children Mm -hmm. uh like you said like you don't get much worse than that and that was one of the seasons that i was on the i I was watching the the end of this uh, season with my wife and i had been up watching the entire i binged it all at one time my wife had kind of come in right around episode seven or eight and i was getting ready to drink coffee when that scene happened and i like took my coffee down i was like what (laughs) are you serious oh my goodness like it really caught me by surprise to kind of see where his character ended up it's kind of uh it's very very well uh done with the development Yeah. yeah Yeah. And also what was interesting, too, is that, you know, while, you know, obviously we're this is loaded with spoiler alerts that while he was um, while he was dying in the last episode, that uh, obviously that need for confession uh, at the end, he had to confess before he died, he had to confess it to somebody, which is why he obviously told it to Trevor and Cypher, because he trust he trusted, I think, that they would figure it out because he had already he had already sent the other guy. Um, what was his name like Sumu or Su- Sunu it was like it was some weird name but the lead of the priory he already sent him out there to his death so mm-hmm. he already knew it's like by the time Trevor and Cypher got there he they would have found it see I took it uh, all right I didn't take it that part of him confessing because he was like you know burn my house like just burn the house down which in the beginning yeah. i don't remember you know if it made it on here and i forgot when we started recording um you know talk about hey, you know, clear your browser history you know always you know joke about that you know if i die please clear my browser history like you don't want to tell him why just do it mm-hmm. um so i took that as him just really actually hiding it till the bitter end and mm-hmm. it was the two of them kind of like oh what's behind door number one it's like oh you know it's it's nike kids you know that's not yeah. cool it's not cool at all so well, which well, is it, even more weird when he comes out of the room sweating well i guess it, it's an interesting argument at that point then because when he did you think then when he was sending them to the apple tree that he was trying to send them to their death 
The kids? Possibly, because you have no. to also... The, uh, Trevor and Saifa. Yeah, oh. I know. But possibly, because you have to think that uh, as they're kind of showing the Museum of Shoes that he's kind of garnered, it looks almost like that he, he doesn't have, like, one exclusivity when it comes to murdering. Like, it's not just like, I'm a kid killer. It's got to be between, you know, ages five and eight. Like, it's got to be exclusive boys that can't be above this level. Like, it looks like, you know, he just he did it for the the absolute sheer thrill of Mm -hmm. killing. Didn't he send them to the to the apple tree first? Because Cypher was like, look, there's bones. Why do they look small? And then they made it to the house. Yeah. So, yeah, I think think, think he was trying to kill him. Yeah. Well. Well, he didn't he didn't instruct them either way which one to do first. So, I mean, the argument could be like if he was trying to send them to their death and they went there first, his house wouldn't have been burned down. Mm-hmm. If they if, if they went to the house first um, and found everything, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. it, it's a weird it's a weird mix. That's why I kind of went along the ways of they would have been able to piece it together, which is why I felt like it was partly a confession. And maybe it was the burn my house down, not necessarily to hide it, but just like for the shame that he felt for what he did. I think he was, I think he realized this is my interpretation. I think he realized they were going to figure it out. Okay. But if you're, if you have a problem with it and when you're alive, I feel like it's a cop out to have shame in death. Like if you just live your life, free of regret to quote watchmen then yeah. when you die it's a it's a it's a good peaceful earned death well, well, I think well when you, when, as i say i think when you talk about something that uh, something uh, uh sinister in this nature and everything like that i think for the for the most part and again i don't i don't know because i've never done anything that sinister um yet uh but i think that uh well that's sinister right there um, Marge simpson is the worst yes of yes she is uh but i think that when um uh, i think that when you're let's say you know when you're dying a lot of people say this like you know when, you, when you're at the end of your life a lot of people say you know you have a lot of regrets like i regret that i did this and stuff you want to live to your point a life without regret this to me was probably his greatest regret even though he felt a need to do this in life now at the end of his life, he's realizing the mistake that he had made in this and the regret that he had for it, which would have prompted some type of confession. Now, also, you know, with the the religious aspect of the show, which really haven't touched on too much yet um, with him, you know, it's also, you know, when you're on your dying bed and you're taking your dying breath, you know, you can basically almost, you know absolve yourself of all your sins you know at the very last moment so you you can head up uh to god and if you want to look at it that way he's probably that's his way of repenting for all that clearing his conscience you know clearing all of his sins and then he goes no for real because in this situation you know they've he may have seen hell with the priory you know they witnessed Mm -hmm. the the demons coming down which leads to the priory and the abundance of what i felt was completely unnecessary fecal jokes um you know for both the priory and in because we haven't even touched on hector uh in the dungeon and everything yet oh we're getting there vampires no i know but i'm just saying i think with him and then we can move on with that i think it's just him yeah kind of his last breath like all right let me clear my conscience and uh because technically speaking if you want to bring the religious aspect into it technically there's nobody in hell um you know that's that's what that's what they say. So uh, he's probably yeah, just wanting yeah. to make sure he doesn't end up there, right? But in the but in the world in the world of in the world of Castlevania that we're watching, yeah, we know for, we know for a fact that there are people. Oh there. yeah, yeah, There's yeah, demons yeah. and so, everything. Yeah, right. So in this world, and and this could have been this could have been his way of trying to not go there because mm-hmm. maybe he think he he thinks he did something altruistic by trying to save the town, which by the way he utterly failed to. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know what I mean? It was just again, it's just that last confession. It's like I'm dying. It's like I, I have to say this or yeah. whatever it may be. Um, so with hell, uh, to Anthony's point, there is a very amazing and cryptic scene that I think all of us kind of knew we were holding our breath for throughout the course of the season. I think with the way that season two ended, we kind of knew, see what we had an idea of what season three was going to be. 
And that, of course, was the resurrection of Dracula. And they teased it in, mm-hmm. in once they get into hell. I think it's like the seventh or eighth episode. They give you a little glimpse into hell and you see mm-hmm. Dracula and, and, his wife. and, his, and his, his wife. wife yeah. And I was so grumpy that they did not <laughs> do anything with that. Yeah. I was like. I was very happy they didn't do anything with well it. Well Be- played. I am too, but I'm also at the same time, I'm like, all right, all right, you have my attention for season four. Well yep. played. And that's exactly what it was, because I felt like if they went if they went right back to it, that was what everybody expected. Like by the end of this season, Dracula's gonna be back and then he'll be season four. I love the fact that they didn't do it, but at the same time, because uh Count Saint Germain wound up in the infinite corridor, I I think that was enough of a tease of Something's going to play out in the infinite corridor that's going to obvious with Count St. Germain that's going to lead to Dracula coming back. I was waiting for Dracula. I'm like, (laughs) bring me Dracula. You know, it's Trevor Belmont. He's got to fight somebody. Fight Dracula. But did you, but did after watching the whole season, did you need it? No. Yes. And I I didn't. I didn't. And I didn't. I didn't either. But here's the two of you nuts with movies. Here's, here's (laughs) what I, here's what I expect it coming into the third season. Dracula is going to be dead maybe towards the end of the season. They are going to set him up to be season four Big Bad. They're going to do something that's going to resurrect him. Mm-hmm. But I was expecting a a like a World War face off, very similar to like DC's Flashpoint between um uh Carmella and Isaac. Like that was kind of the two that I was expecting mm-hmm. to really go. And yep. they they diverted my attention, but they gave me enough of those characters that not only did they world build for future seasons, yeah. but honestly, Isaac probably was one of my favorite characters throughout the course of the season. Just the journey that he got to go on, and they really fleshed his character out. Whereas I felt like in season two, he just kind of he just kind of seemed to exist against noise. But here, yeah. you definitely got to uh, really utilize him and make him a stronger character moving forward into seasons four and onward one of my favorite scenes besides the hentai one of my favorite scenes <laughs> in the show was isaac in that town when all the the people were possessed yes. if you will and then they just formed this giant ball of people yeah. and the visual i thought was just phenomenal um, I really quite enjoyed that. And uh, Josh, if I may get your opinion on this, uh, you know, the symbols that were on their heads and everything was very, to me, was very reminiscent of like the crown of thorns. And, yeah. you know, was this like a, like a, like a, like a Christian uh, group, you know, you know, just trying to fight this evil that ended up coming into town. And then, um, you know, when when the uh, the lead guy, the, whatever his name was, uh, the king was killed. And then just you see every, the bodies just just, mm-hmm. you know, let the bodies hit the floor. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it was no like it was such I'm trying to be serious. Look at me. OK, yeah. I'm trying to be serious here right now. Yeah, um, exactly. The just that whole scene, that whole visual, the animation, the, everything to me was perfect in that scene even with isaac just making his way up there running up you know just trying to get to this almost felt like a level it felt like a video game level yeah yes it did uh yeah to your point i think that it is christian symbology uh i don't know really too much of what it could be interpreted to to either say or mean but to me i think that if you're going to have a world where you have a let's say a like satanic or atheistic approach to magic i think you need that just as well for like a god version because you know where there's a devil there has to be a god where there's bad there has to be good uh where there's a villain there has to be a hero kind of mentality and to that point i think that that's kind of what we started to see um throughout the the course of that particular scene uh, and if you don't mind, I just want to ask Josh one more quick question because I want to get – when I was watching this, I thought of Josh, all joking aside. You know, with your faith that, that you, you express every week, every time on your show, 
how did you feel, if I may ask, and if you want to answer the question, that's okay. The scenes in the church, you know, like with the upside down crucifix and, you know, how a lot of that was being played out. Like, did you feel like, like, did you feel like, ah, you know, this, this show is getting a little weird now. So you, I mean, it's not, it's no weirder than in earlier seasons where churches are literally being burned down. Okay. Right. So for one one of the things that fascinates me personally is psychology and personally how people believe what they believe or how why people are caught up in the religion or worship the gods that they do. I, I, I'm fascinated by cults and that to me just kind of seemed like very much like a cult. Okay. Uh, the way that they approach that and uh, Sala who is the 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 main guy he he just kind of seemed very very atypical of what you would expect from a like a cult leader Mm -hmm. to where he is kind of an extremist uh so to me obviously a lot of what you'll find in cults are people will take a passage from the bible and they will basically twist it to their own needs and they will that is the foundation for which they will build off their religion or their cult at that point and there have been several cults all around the world that have taken portions of scripture that they have read to interpret oh this must mean this and that's how they started to have the occult and that's what you definitely start to see with sala is he's taking this um gift from god as he calls it and he's crucifying it uh down in the the basement Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. clearly it's a monster demon whatever you want to call it night creature night creatures yeah yeah um that has fallen from the sky and you know he's kind of done his his bidding he feels very much like an occult leader so i'm at a point where like i'm able to like Having done a lot of research into the occult mindset and mentality, it's really easy for me to decipher um, yeah. Christianity and and the offshoot, the many offshoots in the occultic lifestyle. Okay, yeah. Plus, you're also dealing with a you're also dealing with a topic that doesn't generally it doesn't generally get covered in um, in um, entertainment and television and film as much, but the, just the darker side of religious history. Yeah. Um, you know, many thing, many things in the history of our oh, world yeah. have been done in the name of religion, many heinous, mm-hmm. heinous things. So, you know, and, and Castlevania is a series that's rife with that. And, um, and, and obviously it's a, it's a key element of the, of the whole story. So it, it, and it's interesting to see the different ways that they've represented that. So, and in this season, obviously we're seeing that with the priory and how, how everything gets twisted to the, you know, to, to this darker side of things where all of a sudden these monks are, are, you know, followers of Dracula and, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're basically crucifying this night creature at his request. You know, there yeah. it was obviously, yeah. it was a means to an end there. But I wanted to circle back to Isaac's story because we just we really just started to touch on it, and um, at G- and to Josh's point, I loved the character development with him because we didn't know him in season two, and the entire story behind his um, journey was he was questioning why why Dracula saved him. Dracula clearly saved him for a purpose, um, and his first intention in terms of that. Uh, is similar to what we saw Alucard go through in season two. Isaac is set up on revenge. He wants revenge on Carmela for what happened to Dracula. Like that is his goal to take out Carmela. So we're seeing we're seeing a new story here, um, but with an old trope that we saw in the last mm-hmm. season. And then throughout his journey, we start to learn a lot more about him and we and his intentions and how even when he's traveling through as a forge master, he's not look he's not looking for a fight throughout the whole show like throughout the whole season he's like uh, yeah every time he comes to he's like i'm not interested in fighting i'm just i we just need to pass through because i have my purpose i know where i'm going and you just see how everybody's reaction to him and obviously the night creatures are what doom them in a way so and and that i thought that was an interesting um i thought that was an interesting um 
take on things because here you go. You see like the quote unquote, one of the villains of the show who's actually just, he's just trying to, you know, he's just trying to get his sole purpose. I go. And then the people that were supposed to be feeling, um, you know, th- that we're supposed to be feeling good about um, actually have twisted it because they're blinded by what they see. And they immediately are like, no, you know what? You guys can't pass. Get the hell out of here. Or we're going to kill you because we know you're evil. Yeah. And if I if I can piggyback off that, I think he has some of the best asides too uh, mm-hmm. throughout the course of this season where whether he is talking to the elderly woman, the elderly mage, I think she was in the rocking chair right before yeah. that big sequence we were just talking about. But possibly uh and i i put this down in my notes um because i really wanted to talk about this scene and uh i think it being this is a this is a hybrid episode and our podcast talks about mental health a lot this was probably one of my favorite scenes in this there's a there's a scene in the third episode where isaac is having a dinner with the captain of the ship that he is on Mm -hmm. and they're He's Isaac is telling the captain uh, his story and his purpose for this journey and in, in rescuing Hector. Uh, to which the the captain shows Hector uh, captain blah, blah, blah. to which he shows the captain the mirror that he has received from the a shop owner as a gift. Uh, that simple act of kindness quickly got pushed by pushed to the way by the prejudiced nature of the town people to which Isaac detests how he hates humans. The captain responds, if you kill e- uh, human evilness, surely you wipe out the human kindness in the same regard. Mm-hmm. And uh, that again, kind of just goes back to the, uh, to the mental health aspect of, you know, really understanding where even if you're meeting someone at like evil, there's also a capacity for someone to be kind and we all have the capacity to be greatly evil. I mean, our history, like you said, and is, is littered with some darkly dark religious crusades. And, but we, it's filled with serial killers and rapists and child murderers all in the same, but it's also, then you have people like Mr. Rogers and, uh, you Mother know, Teresa, Teresa, people that are going over and and saving Me. their lives. I mean, I wouldn't oh. put you in that category. No, wow. that's not good. Well, wow. we, rude. Yeah, I think we just jumped the shark. Rude. Um, <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> but it it begs the question: Do we focus so much on the negative that we fail to see the positive, no matter how small mm-hmm. it is? I think and, that always happens. Yes. Uh, every, I mean, now, uh, you know, everyone's all focused on negative, but, you know, there is positive in what's going on in the world today. Um, and, but that goes with everything. Um, but, yeah, you know, it, it is. You have to have it's that whole yin yang, dark light, good, bad. Um, one cannot survive without the other. That's really what it boils down to. Yeah. And I think and I think what's what, what's also a way to look at it is that we're the should the world ever succumb to one side or the other eventually the other side will return because to your point you can't have one without the other so no matter how dark things get there will always be the light side of Mm -hmm. it um Mm -hmm. even if you think it's gone it's still there it's just biding its time to surge back up again and isaac learned you know in on that ship isaac learned you know a very valuable lesson from the captain which i think also altered his course throughout where he wasn't just on um, he wasn't just on a um, on a crusade to pill uh, to to murder people along the way. And I think we learned that very specifically in the in the town with the king and all of the um, and all of the um, the slaves basically that were under mind control because his purpose to go there was basically I'm going to build my army. Right. That was his goal. He's like, there are plenty of people there. I'm going to forge night creatures. But then he decided even when he got there, he said, just let let the bodies fall Um, instead of turning instead of turning everybody. He chose to kill the king and let everybody let everybody die. Because remember, he said he had to they had to be either wounded or we saw that in the previous town. Yeah, they had to be wounded for him to turn them into night creatures. But when he got to this town. He realized that 
you know, he took a different path. He chose, he's like, I'm not going to turn these people. They, maybe it was, maybe it was a sense of compassion of they already suffered enough under what happened to them, or it was just, you know, whatever the purpose was, kills the king, lets everybody die, doesn't turn them. He also was very specific. He said, you know, kill the townspeople, you know, just get rid of them. Don't burn the village. Yeah. Because he's probably waiting for new crops to come in. Well, that's that, and that's entirely possible. But I think once the mind control, once you, once you kill the king, the mind control is over. So anybody else yeah. who would have been controlling would be gone. So unless he's waiting for people to come and take over the town, because they're like, oh, this town is empty. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just a really, in, I just really enjoyed his journey uh, overall yeah. on the show. And I yeah. will say, my favorite scene in this season was from his was from his story, but. It was one of the asides, like you were talking about, Josh. It was at the end of episode six, The Good Dream, when he pulled the night creature with kind of the fly face with the Mm -hmm, eyes, mm -hmm. when he pulled him out to sit down and talk to him. And the speech that that night creature gave about who who he was when he was alive and the whole story that he tells right there – to me was so amazing and the delivery and the message all of it to me was just just i don't know what it was like it was it was, it was the only scene that actually gave me chills i got like goosebumps okay. just listening to it um and i urge anybody to, to just go back and really sit and focus on the way on that that aside um uh, it just yeah to me like that story had so much meaning behind it in terms of the views of not only this world, but the way that you can view uh, people in our world and why they do the bad things that they do. Um, So I urge you to go back and check that out. Yeah. I really appreciate that sequence as well. And, you know, like you're saying, like it really kind of brings clarity to why we might do some of the more heinous acts that we do as humanity. And, you know, when it boils down to it, like we all are the same, essentially, at, at, to one capacity or another. And we all feel fear. We all feel joy. We all feel anxiety. We all feel sadness or depression or, you know, just uh, happiness and, and sympathy. Like we all go through those emotions and to kind of understand, you know, what brings a person to do something like murder or rape um they're 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 fascinating stories to me and i'm not trying to excuse something like murder or rape but it it really helps you to kind of see a little bit better where that person's kind of coming from and and how that person is nine times out of ten just repeating a cycle that they themselves were in at one point or another yeah, and that is unfortunate that that's something that winds up happening, you know. Um, but again, it's um, it, and I don't know if it's a more science, you know, it's probably more scientific in terms of the way that our brains work and the way that you know when things are ingrained in us at certain points in our lives, how they manage to stick in there. And even though we don't necessarily, we you know, it's the it's the thing of like I'll never ever do that because I've been through that. And then in a lot of cases, it's kind of like your brain is trained to even go in that direction, despite the fact that you don't want to. All right. And with that noise, we are back. We're going to take just a quick break here on the retro gamers um, from Castlevania to talk about a couple of things that uh, we have happened. We still have Josh with us here with the retro gamers. It is an exclusive that we got with Josh. Yeah, it's very special. And, and may I say, it's probably one of the better exclusives we got with Josh because the other exclusives Josh has shared with us have been a little TMI. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah, thank the good Lord they were not, hey, we were not recording. Larry gave me credit on that one. So. I did. I did. Listen, you give credit where credit is due. Sometimes you just have to uh, deal with the consequences. That's all. <laughs> That's so, very true. Uh, uh, Brandon, you're up next. So basically, um, what I want to talk about first real quick, and I, I did a quick video on this, um, because at which you can see on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page, uh, I did this Indiegogo, um, and of game cases. And basically what it is, is this company game custom game uh, makes these custom game cases, uh, for basically almost everything that's not a CD based system and not the switch Mm -hmm. they make. And I'm just going to show it right here because Anthony's not going to be happy about this. 
Yeah, the, the Indiegogo was for Virtual Boy cases. And I got to say, and, I mean, yes, this is Virtual Boy. But now to get your thoughts on this thing, because yeah, these are high quality. No, no, no. They're beautiful cases. They're very well made. You can tell, you know, that with the hard plastic, the, 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 the cover. Now, I guess my question is, yeah, even the inside, like everything about that looks fantastic. The cover is a recreation. Is it an exact recreation of the original? Yeah. So what ha- I didn't realize this when you go on their website. Yes, you get the case and the label. Yeah. And the label is the same label of yes. the game when it came out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For that alone, for that attention to detail, yes, it's fantastic. Uh, do I regret the fact that you bought Virtual Boy ones? Absolutely. And so should you. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And I went on their website after I saw your video on Friday. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, on their website. And yeah. um, I love the fact that they're, you know, they do, um, they do um, Super Nintendo, I believe. They do Sega Genesis. So they have a, they have different systems that you can buy cases for. Um, so I'm definitely all in for that. Um, so they really, really cool stuff. Also, too, have N64, which is really awesome. The way Ooh, that the okay. N64 cases look really awesome. Uh, they have... Uh, and to be know. honest with you, those are probably the ones I would buy because N64 games, when you put them on a shelf, you can't see what they are. Yes. So- uh, also, too, the, the Game Boy collections that they have are, are fairly pretty sweet, too. Um, looking at this one right now, like, they, they look... And I think one of the things that I like most about the the cases, they look and handle a lot like uh, Sega Genesis and Genesis, the way mm-hmm. that they have them, you open them up, they have their they're nice and thick. They have a nice spine to them. They have beautiful visuals. And you can also open this is them not up from the website. And, this is from the original. Uh, see, hey, yeah. is that Subterranea? Yeah, yep. I own that game. There you go. Nice. Um, but yeah. So, yeah. It's they're they're very nice cases. Yeah, so I think um yeah I think the N sixty four route would be the way that I would go because again all, like with the, all my games on my shelves I can never read what N sixty four games I have I have to pull them out <laughs> every time. And here's here's what I like about them as well. And you're right, you know, like the Genesis ones, they just look like the Genesis ones. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so if you even need a replacement, they're not expensive at all, and you can get them in either black or red. Uh, Game Gear, you can get like three different types of covers. So you can get Game Gears that look like the the Genesis ones, just a little smaller. Sweet. And like Josh said, you can get N64, which to Anthony's point makes sense with the spine and everything. Mm-hmm. Like I have one, two, three, four. I have six Genesis games right now that are out of box. I bought them loose yeah honestly i think they're five bucks each per box they have all six of these games perfect so and i can just get right in. i can throw them right in and they look original i did email them though see maybe if they saw making ones for the ea genesis games oh uh, yeah the were a little ones. yeah a little larger but um yeah check them out customgamecases.com definitely check them out because uh, if you're looking for cases they even sell blank cases if you just need a, 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 another case made um i think they're they're not 3d printed i think they're actually like what do they call that um like pressed or whatever you want to call them like plastic or whatever okay. um so definitely high quality definitely check them out again customgamecases.com yeah, they're, they're definitely on my shopping list that was a good buy Yep. That's a good yeah, buy, Larry. Even if it was Virtual Boy. Same. Now yeah. I need to... Because I, I have probably like four or five loose Sega games that I need cases mm-hmm. for. So now I know that I can go ahead and do those fairly cheap. Boom. Yep. And nice. I think even at a certain price, real quick, then Anthony will go, I think at a certain price, they may even do free shipping or something like that. So uh, That's cool. Uh, is that is that all you bought this week? From what I remember, yes. Okay. Well, I bought one thing this week well, that I wanted to share. Technically, oh, I bought those got? like eight months ago. Well, yeah, but they just came. Well, and then I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share what I bought this week because okay. it was a. It was definitely a busy shopping week for me, um, and I would love to say that I bought a ton of video game stuff, but I didn't. But I just want to share what I did buy this week. Oh, there so we go. See, yeah, uh, because for some odd reason, everybody has gone crazy <laughs> and has bought all the toilet paper in the land. It so, is yeah. That's that's better than a video game right now. No, I'm telling. Let, let me tell you something. If anybody out there has like you know a Shining Force three or Shining Force CD <laughs> that they're or you know some really inexp- you know expensive game that they're looking, looking to pawn off, it's like I am happy to trade one roll per game. I wonder uh, if Game Dude buy that back. Right. Exactly. If I bring this to Game Not Dude, used. how much money do you think I can get? Not used. 
Well, you know, but uh, in all seriousness, like, you know, that th- this is actually a very scary thing that you can't find toilet paper everywhere. <laughs> but anyway. I got him into showers. Oh, boy. Um, and I also I also hear there's been a surge on bidets. People are <laughs> buying <laughs> people are buying bidets. But anyway, uh, I have my own anyway. Yeah, not video game related, of course. But um, you know, with the with the, you know with the current uh, with the current climate right now, with the coronavirus going on and everything like that, um, you know, just from the retro gamers, and I'm sure from you as well, Josh. You know, we hope everybody out there stays safe, stays healthy. Um, you know, I know I don't know about you, Larry. I'm going to be staying indoors a lot. Uh, for a little while, which which is definitely going to mean more gaming for me. Well, I'm going to have to do some commuting right now, so that's about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's being... I was actually supposed to go see uh, King Kong today, as of this recording, and the big screen, I canceled that, but that was more because... Uh, the certain uh, movie theater company being jerks about a refund because my father, who's in his 70s, decided smart on his part not to want to go to the movie theater at this point in time. And they're like, nope, sorry, we can't yep. refund just one ticket. I'm like, you know what? Take them both wow. back. I'm good. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, L.A., the L.A. theaters right now, some of the theaters, what they're doing is they're only selling certain seats and they're like five or six seats apart. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's it's wacky. Yeah, Josh. It's also most theaters right now. I know that yeah. AMC and Regal both have issued uh, social distancing. So if a theater yep. is capped at 250 people, they are only selling 125 tickets. Uh, so they're only selling half of what the theater can hold. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of that going on. But again, um, there, again, there's not necessarily a bright side to these things. Everybody out there needs to stay safe. For us, uh, I know I'm gonna. I'm going to catch up on some games that I've been meaning to finish uh, as part of our 2020 game challenge. Well, and I got some games as well. We're going to talk about that actually as the hybrid episode continues. But I do want to mention this. Let's talk about some good stuff, which I th- – oh, what I did see, which Ant, going into this, I did s- – was worried the topic to talk about was some delays mm. of video game systems because of the virus. But to be fair, A – you know, with with the travel ban and everything that a lot of countries are doing, it wasn't really that ban wasn't really put towards imports and exports as well. Mm-hmm. But um, the Polymega, something we've been talking about since probably the inception of this podcast, mm-hmm. finally has some major updates because I believe they are back in production um, because China is starting to, to come down from all this and it's starting the factories are starting to go back into play. Yeah. So. Here's some information. First of all, neither me or Anthony right now have been picked for the beta for Polymega, but there is a second round of emails to go out. So we Ooh, may still have a shot fingers at this. Crossed. Right? Fingers, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All the fingers. Uh, this is from the Polymega website. The pre-orders on Walmart and Amazon will go live starting April 15th. So now you can start pre-ordering this from major retailers. Nice. Um Let's see. Uh, let's do, 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 do. Retail launch. Uh, starting on April 15th, uh, the base unit. Wow, we got it at a deal, Ant. The base unit with a wireless controller will go for $400. Wow. And the modular sets, NES, SNES, Genesis, and Tomographic, will be $80 each. Mm. Um, I'm glad I bought it when I did. <laughs> so, and again, they even mentioned with... China's starting to pick things up again. Um, as long as the situation remains stable for the next 30 to 60 days, they're looking to stage the beta releases March, April, and May. And the street date release is July 6th for all pre-orders. So we're looking at July 6th. Nice. Worst case scenario. What a great way to celebrate our Independence Day than picking yourself true. up a polybega. Yes, absolutely. So some good news coming out of this, um, or at least some some happier news, I suppose. Everyone talked about toilet paper and right. and whatnot uh, being sold well, and out. Of course, so. we know that the uh, Turbo Graphics Mini has been delayed because of everything going on. Yes, it so. has. And I was looking forward to that too, man. I was. No, nope, so was I. But look again, priorities. Things. Yeah. You know, people, we got we need wipe to make it sure down that... when it comes in the house. <laughs> no, we just need to, we need to make sure everybody stays safe and healthy. Yeah. That's priority. Well, uh, so with that being said, uh, Josh, do you have anything to add to any of this? You picking up a polymega? Uh, no, I'm Fair I'm enough. still looking at these cases. 
All right, so, so, those so we know, are awesome. No, we, they are. We know yeah. Josh is going to go case shopping. Anthony is also going to go case shopping as well. I'll be honest with you. Let me ask you, because I know Ann has more games. Josh, what games do you have? Like, what cases are you looking for? Uh, I honestly, I know that I need a Sonic game. The the first Sonic I need, or either mm-hmm. Sonic or Sonic Two, I think it is, uh, is what one I need. Um, I know I need a Super Terrain, uh, which is the game that you just had featured, um, not that long ago. And I know I have probably one or two more that I need, but they are currently all packed away because my wife and I are getting ready to move. Oh yeah, that's right. That's Good luck right. With that. When when is the move officially? Uh, sometime next month. I don't know yet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we wish you the best with that. Happy packing. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Shelling out the big bucks. Yeah. Yes. All my entertainment is like, uh, like, like ninety percent of my books, ninety percent of my movies, all my systems. Like, it's all packed away right now. Wow. All well, right. Cool. Moving. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, I am not looking forward to it if I ever have to do it again. So. Yeah. Right. And I am right now stuck up here, and I'm happy about it. No, you so. stay there. Yes, and uh, all right. So, and did you pick up anything else? You have soap. You have water. Uh, well, I mean, I have water because you know what, the sink works just fine. I don't know why everybody <laughs> was going crazy. Everybody thinks that the water is getting turned off. The water will be fine. Um, well, it's only water. Yeah, I picked up. Well, yeah, that's another story. <laughs> uh, yes, I I picked up my usual case of water. I have provisions at home. Okay. I am pretty sure that I will be safe. If if I do start to run out of things, you know what? That that's why Grubhub and Postmates are still working. That's why restaurants are still open. Yep. So uh, this is probably again, and not you know, I know this is a retro game, is but this is a perfect time to support your local businesses because they're going to need it. So if you you know if if you do still, uh, if you you know usually order from certain places, give them a little bit of extra love, you know, for the next few weeks if you can, because uh, you know a lot of places are going to be hurting. And with that, I think World of Warcraft is probably seeing a surge in in online gameplay at this point. Yeah, this the, is what the, we're both prepared for the 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 sixteen hour a day players have now become twenty two hour a day players. <laughs> yeah. This is where we're at. We've been training for this. Uh, all right, so we're actually for the retro gamers and uh, I guess victims and villains, but this is exclusive. Victim and villains ain't here in any of this. So for the retro gamers, we're actually going to come back with part two of our Castlevania series review on Netflix season three. So make sure to check that out next week. Um, and of course. Every Friday, you're going to hear classic episodes of the Retro Gamers. Um, the first 28 episodes will be are going up audio and YouTube, and then 29 through 99 will go up audio on YouTube, so you can check those out. And actually, since we're closing up this week, follow us up on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube at Retro Gamers Podcast. Hit us up on Twitter at the uh, excuse me at Retro Gamers Pod. We want to hear from you. And hit them with the website and the uh, email. Yep, you can uh, check out our website at theretrogamers.com, or you can email us at email at theretrogamers.com. And since we're wrapping up this week, uh, Josh, please promote your stuff. All right, you guys can uh, follow us everywhere, social media, suicide prevention resources, episodes, reviews, contact, upcoming events, and more at victimsandvillains.net. Awesome. And with that, we will catch you for part two right here next week on the Retro Gamers Podcast. <laughs>